to Sense and Sensibility, the Inflation Guy podcast. I am Michael Ashton. I am the Inflation Guy, and I am your host. Today on the podcast, I'm going to talk about inflationary folk remedies. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about the Chapwood Index, and that kind of produced some other people writing to me about various other things. Um, the Chapwood Index sort of falls into a general category, but I'm going to talk about a few other items uh, that fall into that classification and explain what I mean by, by folk remedies. And then in a couple of weeks, sorry, actually, I mean I mean next week is what I'm going to try to, uh, I'm planning to talk about where we are in sort of the big picture inflation story. So last week I, you know, talked about, as I do every month, about the particular CPI report and uh, and kind of where we are in sort of this, you know, the the near term episode. But I want to step back, and you know, one of the nice advantages of having been doing this for for multiple decades is that you get a, a, a sense of context of kind of where we are in the grand scheme of things, cyclically or inflationally, inflationarily cyclically. And so I'm going to talk about that. Uh, that's my plan for next week. <clears throat> but before I Get into any of this. Uh, let me first thank our sponsor. Our, our this episode of Sense and Sensibility is sponsored by Simplify ETFs. Simplify is a new ETF provider offering an alternative investment strategies with full transparency, daily liquidity, low costs. Some of their hedge fund style strategies include managed futures, commodity trend following, steepener trades, and more. If you are an individual investor or an RIA, you will likely find a compelling alternative investment from Simplify that can help improve your portfolio. Check out their website at simplify.us and their entire lineup of ETFs at simplify.us slash ETFs. And as I said last week, yeah, they recently crossed $2 billion in assets. <clears throat> so they're, not, uh, they're, still, they're still new, but no longer quite as small. Uh, one other preliminary, and that's the trivia question. And I'm going to ask this trivia question in an easier way. I, rather than ask you the origin of a particular financial term, which you'd never get, I'm going to tell you the origin and ask you what the term is. And, of course, I'll tell you at the end of this broadcast. So the term that I'm thinking of comes from the way the French populace used to refer to the periods of default on external debt when France would, would default on external debt. Uh, and during that time, during those times, French kings had a custom of executing major domestic creditors, like killing them. Um, so what did the French people call these periods? And it's a term that we, we still use today. <clears throat> and I'll tell you in just a little bit. So today I want to talk about folk remedies. I had to hunt around a little bit for what to call this. Um, uh, and, and let me explain what I mean. So a folk remedy is a well-meaning supposed cure that's developed, proposed, and administered by people without the background to really understand what, what it is that they're doing. There's so-called cures that aren't rigorously tested uh, and may or may not have any efficacy. But as a first cut... You wouldn't expect a folk remedy to be as useful as, say, a drug that's been examined, tested, and field tested for years. If you have a headache, you're probably going to take aspirin or ibuprofen or some other anti-inflammatory. Uh, and we understand really well how those things work and what it is that they're doing. But some people would say, hey, take some magnesium for your headache because – you know, magnesium isn't particularly bad for you. It might be good for you in this case. Um, it's probably a bad example because probably somebody has studied, you know, whether taking magnesium for a headache is is a good thing. But it's a folk remedy. Um, it probably has been tested. But maybe a better example is rubbing lavender oil on your wrists, which some people will do for a headache. Me, I will take take an ibuprofen. It's been we we know that that we know what it does. Rubbing lavender oil on your wrists would be quite pleasant. would be very nice. I like the smell of lavender. I'm not sure it's going to have anything to do with my headache. Uh, anyhow, a folk remedy is something which might work, but I'd feel better if my doctor 
my doctor recommended it to me rather than, you know, the LIBOR swaps trader who once mixed me a concoction of zinc, ginger, ginkgo, and Sprite uh, to cure my head cold. It's a true story. I was feeling really bad, and he, uh, he said, oh, I've got something for you. And he mixed up this truly awful-tasting concoction, which did nothing that I could discern for my head cold except make me wish even more that I was dead. So anyway, <clears throat> so that's a, that's a folk remedy. Might work, but there's really no reason to naturally expect that, that the people pushing it have any background in it. So the key aspect is that the person developing the remedy isn't a specialist in the field. It doesn't mean the person's dumb. A physicist talking about behavior modification might be another example. He or she might be right, but shouldn't you ask somebody who specializes in behavior modification, maybe a psychologist or something? And another key aspect of the folk remedy moniker here is that it's innocent. Someone who's trying to tell you something and usually sell you something while they know or should know that it doesn't work, that's a snake oil salesman, and that's not what I'm talking about. So two weeks ago, as I said, I, I talked about the Chapwood Index just by way of sort of illustration. That index might be a folk remedy or it might be snake oil. I don't, I don't really know. I don't really know what their motivations are. I don't know how they're, they're pushing it necessarily. As I mentioned on that broadcast, it's not a particularly good index, um, but it might be innocently not a particularly good index. Um, you know, it might be a, a, a re, you know, their reasonable attempt at, to try to do something useful. Um, they, they just don't really know anything about inflation, and so they came up with something which is kind of nonsense. Um, on the other hand, you know, shadow stats is run by a snake oil salesman. Um, it's not even debatable. I mean, it, it, I guess the, his defense would have to be that he is so stupid that maybe he believes what he says, but it is so easy to show that what Shadow Stats is, is purveying is just plain garbage. It's hard to claim ignorance. And so uh, in my you know, pantheon here, my explanation, I would say that's a snake oil salesman. And Chapwood, I don't, I don't really know, probably a, a folk remedy uh, chance of a snake oil salesman. So I'm setting this all up because um, I've got several items to sort of all discuss um, that I'm going to throw in the category of folk remedies. These are things that people have sent to me recently and asked my opinion of. But they're decent ideas, and some of them are even decently executed, um, but they're not built by someone with a deep knowledge of inflation. Uh, you know, when I listen, you know, when I talk to other people, when I, when I think about inflation, when I read about inflation, when, I, when I'm looking for information about inflation, you know, I'll listen to Henry Wilmore, uh, Omar Sharif, both of whom sell their inflation expertise. Um, I don't always agree with them, but I completely respect that they have deep knowledge of inflation and I respect the amount of time they've spent studying it. Robert McClelland, uh, formerly of the, of the uh, BLS Inflation Division, um, there's no doubt he knows what he's doing. And, uh, and I would, I would you know, trust him to come up with something pretty clever and, and, uh, uh, and I would start from the assumption that he knows what he's doing. And I'd throw a few other names out there, but there aren't a whole lot of them. Uh, so here are a couple items that people who probably mean well, uh, but they're out over their skis and they produce something which isn't necessarily particularly helpful. The most obvious of them was brought to my attention um, in an opinion piece in the New York Times recently. Um, the article, which is linked in the notes, was entitled, This Statistic Could Be Distorting How We Think About Inflation. And it described how an economist named Preston Mui, who, important fact here, just earned his PhD in economics last year. So you know, your initial assumption is going to be that the guy's not been around all that long. Um, but he wrote in a blog post, uh, this Mui character, that, quote, economists and policymakers are making too much of one widely followed statistic, the unit labor cost. Now, Mui is a senior economist um, at Employ America. And again, one year out of school, he's a senior economist. So I'm, I'm sort of baffled by by all of this. I mean, it seems like you should have to have some, exper some experience to... Be a senior economist, but whatever. 
Uh, he does – he correctly identifies in his article a lot of the problems with the unit labor cost measure. And here's the thing. No one who has been around inflation for more than about 20 minutes pays any attention at all to your labor costs. It's a terrible indicator, and we all know it's a terrible indicator. Look, it's part of the productivity report, and we know that the productivity report is revised for five or ten years after its initial release. And it's probably still wrong after that because of some systematic things that are wrong. So nobody would look at the unit, unit labor costs who knows anything about inflation. He says in his article that policymakers do look at unit labor costs, and he, he cites some examples. But that's not really – the way, the way he's citing it, it's not quite the same thing. It's one thing to use the idea of unit labor costs as a building block of the total costs of output, right? So you've got to, you know, how do you, you know, uh, figure out the, the you know, total amount of money spent? Well, it's got to be, you know, the amount of uh, units of labor you put in it, uh, you know, times the unit labor cost. And you don't have to necessarily have good um, uh good forecasts of those things or good measures of those things to know that that's a plausible way of breaking it down and that therefore you can sort of break down um, growth into, you know, a change in sort of the total amount of labor uh, and a change in the output per labor, that's productivity, and a change in the cost per unit of output. Notionally, that makes perfect sense. That's entirely separate from measuring it. And everybody who spends any time around this knows that we just don't measure any of that stuff very well. So anyone who's actually using that, you know, actually, you know, waiting breathlessly on the number just doesn't really know what they're doing. OK, so um, so anyway, I, I, you know, the concept is sound. It's just impossible to measure. So don't believe anything else. And And again, you know, so the guy who's writing this article saying, don't look at union labor costs. Well, that's a that is great advice. And and anyone who didn't already know that, you're probably very happy to know that now. But if you are an inflation person, if you are a – most policymakers would not look at union labor costs as really meaning a whole heck of a lot and being something that they're going to sort of base their entire argument around. So that's item one. Item two um, moves up the plausibility chain a little bit. Um, it's kind of a it's a hybrid case um, because I think the person who who did the original research understands the limitations of the research, and and even and, and the, the, the original authors talk about them in their work. Um, and and the one name on that list that I kind of know is um, Randover Brugge. Um, who was also at the BLS for a while, um, I think. Anyway, he's at the Cleveland Fed now, and he's definitely an inflation guy. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, the other authors that are of, of the original paper, I don't necessarily know. Uh, but Verbergi co-authored this paper called, and again, it's, it's linked in the notes, called Disentangling Rent Index Differences, Data, Methods, and Scope. And it's a really, really good article. If you want to go read his paper... Uh, read their paper if you if you want to understand how the BLS measures rent and how that differs from many other measures of rent. It's it's really really a good a good uh, indication a, a good uh, depiction of that or, or description of that. So far so good. Um, then the authors <laughs> and I wonder if they wish they hadn't done this. They create a couple of new indices from the data that's used by the BLS. So they take the BLS microdata and they create two new indices. Uh, two new rent series, and one of them is called the New Tenant Repeat Rent Index, and the other one is called the All Tenant Repeat Rent Index, NTRR and ATRR. Um, and, and the idea is that these are using the same data that the BLS uses, which we know are, are pretty high-quality data, Um Unlike with, like, say, Zillow, we don't really know how good the Zillow data necessarily is, but we we trust the BLS data because they've been doing this for a very, very long time. We know exactly how they do it, and they have a very, very large sample. So, and they take that and they say, well, the problem with it is it's really slow, and we want something that gives us a better indication of where it's going to go. So, they create these new indices. Um. 
Now, the problem is that these new indices have been heralded as the best new thing in inflation forecasting because they give more, quote, real-time information about how rents are developing. But here's the question. How can you use the same data and get more information out of it? Okay, suppose I start with a set, some set of data, and it has five units of information. Now I take away some of that data, and what's left has eight units of information. How did that happen? The only way a smaller set can have more information is if what you're discarding has negative information. It's, it's systematically bad. Not just unbiased, it's actively bad. Okay, but The authors don't claim that. Um, in fact, their, their paper is done it has, it's pretty smart quantitatively. It recognizes that the way this manifests, if you try to put 20 pounds of poop in a 10-pound bag, is that what you get is much wider error bars. And, and, and they say that for these short-term forecasts, these three-month, six-month forecasts, you get much, much wider error bars, much wider error bars. And that's strong econo econometrics. That's what you'd expect. And so they're not the folk remedy pur purveyors, the authors of the article. The, the folk remedy purveyors are all the other folks who don't understand that those large error bars make the new indices kind of close to useless as, as early indicators, at least not any better than other indicators we already have, which have their own problems, of course. But, but some economists and investors especially – and I guess journalists really especially, they don't like error bars and what they mean. Um, they don't necessarily understand them. You know, if I have an estimated mean, an estimated average of 25, and I have an error bar that runs from 20 to 30, that doesn't mean that 25 is my best guess, so I can kind of go with that. Um, it actually means that I really can't say anything about where the true mean falls, except that I'm pretty sure it's between 20 and 30. Um, we use the, the mean to sort of get to the error bars, but it, you don't know that it that something close to 25 is better than something at the edge of the error bar because that's what the error bar means. So I can't reject the null that the true mean is somewhere other than at 25, but somewhere in that, that category. Non-quants have a hard time internalizing that, but the simple point is that if you have a data set and you create a smaller data set, from that data set, then you're going to end up with larger error bars. That's just, that's just kind of the nature of what happens. And so, and so what that means is you have these two new series, AT, ATRR and NTRR, and I'll pay attention to them just like I pay attention to the Zillow rents, but I'm just not going to put a ton of weight into them because, you know, those estimates are going to change a lot from when they're first released to when we actually get real high quality data. Um, Again, you know, the people who wrote the paper, it's a great paper, really worth reading, um, insightful, smart. Those two indicators, you know, and they, they put the error bars on there. It's what the people who have interpreted and decided that that's a great new indicator and didn't understand what, what the significance of that error bar thing was. Okay, number three on the list today and the last one um, is another – this is – so the first one was not quantitative at all. Uh, you know, unit labor costs suck. Second one was quantitative and just a little thing that people kind of don't really get and they abuse. The third one is really quantitative. <laughs> um, it's a really neat index and model and it's put out by the New York Fed building on work, uh, 2016 work by Stock and Watson. Um, it's called Multivariate Core Trend Inflation and the link again, is in the notes. And, and the Fed, New York Fed, now puts this out you know, as, a, as an estimate. Um, and it's designed to measure inflation's persistence in the 17 core sectors of the PCE price index. Okay. Unfortunately, it's the PCE price index, which makes it kind of useless for inflation traders. But here's what the index attempts to do. It decomposes the inflation rate into three, uh, four pieces a common trend of inflation, the sector-specific trend, so, you know, healthcare versus the overall, a common transitory or transient shock, and a sector-specific transitory or transient shock. 
And that's a pretty smart way to think about inflation. And in fact, that's kind of how we at Enduring Investments, that's how we think about modeling, say, medical care inflation. Is we know that medical care inflation will be higher when overall inflation is at 12 than when overall inflation is at 1. So we can sort of think about medical care inflation as being composed of the general level of inflation plus some basis. Some, you know, what the difference between medical care in inflation and regular overall inflation, what drives that? And so that's kind of what they're doing. You have the common trend, then you have sort of the sector specific trend, the common transitory uh, uh, shock, and the sector specific transitory shock, and that all adds up to inflation. So it's a pretty smart way of, of, pretty smart way of looking at the thing, and it makes good sense. The problem is that. The problem really is, again, is a quantitative one. And the model is trying to estimate an enormous number of factors, an enormous number of variables, including unknowable ones that it's trying to tease from the data. 17 sectors, four elements of each, factor loadings for everything. Um, The unknowable ones are sort of the transitory shocks, which it's divining entirely quantitatively. Um, And it finds lots of shocks. And, of course, it doesn't define what the shock was. It just says, okay, that's an outlier. That's a shock. And interesting quantitatively, not terribly useful from from the standpoint of a a policymaker, for that matter, uh, or for that matter, a trader. Um, The quantitative – and, 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 and by the way, the original data that's going into all this has a tremendous amount of noise already. So you're trying to, you know, churn all these estimates from a lot of numbers that have a lot of noise already built in. The quantitative exercise is really interesting. Make your head hurt if you read the paper, but it, it, it is interesting. But you can see where the authors are quants and they're not inflation guys. They point out... <laughs> they got some funny things. They point out that their error bars around their estimates are considerably narrower when they use 17 sectors when they use just one. Um, they compare the forecast accuracy to a bunch of other quantitative models, which is what I would do if I wanted my forecast to look great. I would also compare it to a bunch of models that we know are terrible. So, um, but here, here are the, a few of the results of the forecasting experiment. First, these are almost exact quotes, by the way. Forecasts that use moving averages of past inflation are more accurate than forecasts that don't use moving averages of past inflation. Okay, that's not really a surprise to me. Second, forecasts get more accurate if we downweight some sectors, notably energy. Quote, forecasts that put little or no weight on energy are more accurate than forecasts based on headline inflation, unquote. (laughs) Well... We knew that. Uh, That's why we look at core and trim mean and median and so on. And then finally, um, uh, there are only small, perhaps zero, marginal improvements in accuracy for the multi-sector forecast relative to using core inflation single-sector forecasts. So their big conclusion in, in the, in, in the, really, in the conclusion of the paper, one of the big conclusions is that there are substantial gains from using sectoral inflation, okay, all 17 sectors, instead of using headline inflation because headline has this thing in there that is oil and energy. And so you really want to downweight that. But if you use all, if you're going to use headline inflation in, in, as your comparison, then you should use all 17 sectors because then you can sort of you know, tease that out. Okay, big, big conclusion. The other one is that much, and they're very honest about this, much of the accuracy that they, that improved accuracy can be achieved from estimates constructed from traditional core measures of inflation. Wait, what? <laughs> you just wrote this huge paper. Again, the folk remedy purveyors aren't Stock and Watson who developed a pretty interesting, if way overcomplicated model, but then had the intellectual honesty to say, eh, it doesn't really do a lot. It doesn't really help you very much. I mean, that is intellectually honest. It's a neat, and it, by the way, it's so, it's so ivory tower academic, it's crazy, right? It's like, you know, this model is fancier and it doesn't really help you very much, but it's some neat math. Um, uh, but they said, you know, there's no real point using this. We've got, you know, you can do just as well using traditional measures. 
The folk remedy purveyors are the New York Fed, who use this really complicated whiz-bang model to publish something that even the authors, the original authors, felt was of limited value. Why? 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 We haven't got we already have too many inflation, you know, measures of median inflation. I use median inflation. There's, you know, uh, trimmed mean inflation. There's um, sticky inflation. There's all kinds of different ways to look at this stuff. Why would you add one that admittedly doesn't add anything um, and accept lots and lots and lots of complexity? Um Anyway, now look, none of these three examples that I've given are a snake oil salesman. Okay, they're all trying to be honest and prove the science of inflation, put something new out there. Some of it's really, really clever, um, you know, f- interesting to read if, you, if you're interested in inflation and the way I'm interested in inflation. You know, it might be interesting. Um, the problem is that for none of them is this really their field. You know, again, you know, with the Verbrugge group, you know, that is sort of their field, but they're not the ones who are misinterpreting the work. Um, for, for every one of us, everyone listening, myself, everyone I know, you have to remember that most of what we read is not in our field. And, and so you can't discern good remedies and from folk remedies from snake oil very well. That's why it's important to look at who it is that's doing the selling and ask, is this a doctor who should know about this particular remedy or is it somebody who, you know, maybe is a generalist or is this someone who really has nothing to do with, with this whole thing? And so, you know, you can recognize that while an economist knows something about inflation, just like a general practitioner knows something about your heart, um, for heart surgery, you really want to go to the heart surgeon. Uh, and not to just a general practitioner. So you should always remember that. Always be skeptical. You know, when you read about these, you know, fancy indices and these fancy new studies or whatever, stop and look at at who it is that that wrote the thing or who's talking about it and and ask whether they have the chops. Do they they actually have the background to understand what it is that, you know, whether or not this advances the science or not? And, um, and unfortunately, we, most of the news we consume is so filtered that by the time it gets to us, it goes through the hands of a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing. And so, unfortunately, we don't all have time to go and read original research in every, every field that you, you know, that, that you have in, any interest in, in the output of. And so you have to sort of develop the trusted channels. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I'm sort of developing your trust in me um, as one of those channels. So um, the other problem is that there's no certification program for inflation experts. You can go get your PhD in, in uh, uh, heart and cardiology and that, you know, you can go get your, your medical degree and, and you can go get your juris doctorate if you're a lawyer and those are all certification programs. There's nothing like that for inflation expertise. And so it's, you know, you would think you you look at something from the New York Fed and you say, those people probably know something about inflation. First pass, almost same with the Fed. Good good first guess is that they don't understand inflation. <laughs> but anyway. All right. So here's the answer to the trivia question. So the question, the, so the term comes from the way the French populace used to talk to these periods of default when the French kings would execute domestic creditors as just part of their default. And the French people uh, called this bloodletting. So when the next time you hear about a major bloodletting happening on Wall Street, now you'll know where that term came from. And incidentally, I got that from the book this time is different by right reinhardt and rogoff the link to that as to everything else is in the notes and that's all for today's podcast uh, please like subscribe maybe write a review refer others uh, to the podcast you can contact me at inflation guy at enduring investments.com and uh, you can go to inflationguy.blog and subscribe for free to the, to the blog which is different from the podcast most of the time Visit Enduring Investments if you if you need an inflation expert. And but most importantly, one way or another, defend your money. And if inflation is coming for you, remember, you know a guy.